Yeah. Seven days. Yeah. yeah. So that's how we. That's the real problem. It's a summer. Again. My name is Stephanie Spears. I'm Council of Program Development here at the Law Society, and I'm pleased to welcome you today to our program, Chronic Pain, Chronic Fatigue, and Fibromyalgia, Strategies for Litigating and Defending Pain-Related Cases. So welcome to those of you here in Toronto and all of our viewers um, at our ILN locations across Ontario. I have a few announcements before I introduce our chairs today. If you're carrying a cell phone, please set it to vibrate or turn it off. Secondly, you'll find at the front of your binder an evaluation form and if you could kindly just take it out right now and set it beside you and remember to fill it out and check off the various um, speakers as they go along that would be great we really appreciate your feedback especially with regards to our new format so for those of you in our ILN sites please also um, fill out the forms and fax them back to us and for those of you in Toronto we do have drop boxes that are available outside the lecture hall and you can drop them off at the end of the day we appreciate that also for the Toronto audience, just to let you know that we do videotape in Toronto, so your voice or image could be captured on videotape today. For our ILN delegates, please remember to check off your name on the sign-in sheets at your location. There are several question and answer periods built into the day today. Please note that our operator will be going to your site and asking if there is a question and you'll have an opportunity to either say yes or no and go ahead with your questions. There is a momentary muting when the ILN operator uh, checks into your site, um, just for your uh, information. We will start with the remote sites and then ask, um, and then take questions in Toronto. You'll notice that there are two microphones set up in the aisles for the Toronto audience. Please use them so that when people are watching by video, they can hear your questions. And also, Dr. Harth and Peter Downs are speaking from London, so you'll be watching them by video. Finally, I would like to give a um, very heartfelt thanks to our chairs and our presenters who have put a great deal of time and effort into preparing for this program and preparing their materials. Um, Hugh Scher, I'll start with introducing Mr. Scher, is a partner at the law firm of Scher and DeAngelis Professional Corporation, where he practices civil litigation and administrative law with a focus on insurance, employment, human rights law, especially in the area of disability rights. He is counsel of the National MEFM Action Network and Ontario Fibromyalgia Society and has represented unions and dozen of, dozens of individuals with fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome uh, in disputes with long-term disability insurers, the CPP, Employers and Revenue Canada. And I will refer you to their biographies because there's a wealth of information there about their extensive backgrounds. Let me introduce briefly as well uh, Jeffrey Loudon, our co-chair. Jeff was called to the bar in 1989. He is with um, he is Assistant Vice President, President and Senior Counsel at Sun Life Assurance Company of Canada. After practicing general commercial litigation at Fraser & Beatty, Jeff joined the Sun Life Law Department in 1996. He currently practices litigation in the areas of disability and life insurance. So I will now turn the microphone over to Hugh. Thank you, Stephanie, and thanks to all the people at the Law Society for all their her hard work and effort. Um, I welcome you, uh, the Toronto delegates, for this conference, and all those from London, Niagara, Ottawa, Sudbury, and Thunder Bay. In total, we have approximately 200 people, I believe, registered for this conference, which I believe is a resounding success. This conference is an important conference, touching on issues relating to chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia syndrome, and chronic pain, and how one deals with these situations, both from a medical perspective and from a legal perspective, be it in the workplace, in dealing with various administrative tribunals, or various benefit entitlements, either with long-term disability insurers, employers, the Canada Pension Plan, or with the Financial Services Commission. Chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia have been somewhat contentious conditions over the years, uh, and we have a distinguished and esteemed medical faculty who will be here to address the new developments in diagnosis and treatment 
with respect to chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. And we also have an esteemed <coughs> panel of legal speakers to address issues including the uh, preparation of a case in order to avoid litigation, <coughs> in order to address issues such as how to process a long-term disability claim to avoid litigation, and secondly, how to deal with and act for a plaintiff or defendant in a litigation claim relating to chronic pain, chronic fatigue, and fibromyalgia syndrome. We're also going to deal with issues that arise in the context of the workplace, be they issues around accommodation, issues around uh, what the impact on the employer is of absenteeism and how that can and should be dealt with. And we also have a very distinguished and esteemed panel of jurists and arbitrators who are going to come together to tell us from an adjudicator's perspective what is it that an adjudicator looks for from counsel in the presentation and persuasive um, prosecution of a case relating to chronic pain, chronic fatigue, and fibromyalgia syndrome. These cases present challenges for the medical community, they present challenges for the legal community, and they present challenges to the judicial and the administrative bodies that oversee these areas, but most importantly, they present challenges to those who suffer from these conditions, who deal with them day in and day out. And hopefully today we'll get some insight into what that's about and how we can make this process a more meaningful process for all the stakeholders involved. And I thank you for your participation here today. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Hugh. Um, we're going to start the program today by looking at the medical aspects of chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and chronic pain syndrome. And in that respect, we're fortunate to have with us uh, two, two extremely experienced uh, medical practitioners, Dr. Um, Manfred Harth, who, as Stephanie said, is going to be joining us from London over the, the video feed, and uh, Dr. Bill Fong, who's here with us in Toronto. Dr. Uh, Dr. Harth is an emeritus professor of medicine at the University of Western uh, Ontario. He's an, atten an attending physician, Department of Medicine, Division of Rheumatology at St. Joseph's Healthcare Centre in London as well. Uh, Dr. Fong is the Director of Infectious Disease at St. Michael's Hospital and as well a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. And uh, as Stephanie said before, if you want to take a look at uh, their, their biographies, they're included in your materials. They both have quite a, a depth of experience. So Dr. Fong, I'll turn it over to you next. And um, what we've planned is that each of the doctors would speak to us for about 12 or 15 minutes, and then hopefully we'll have about 10 minutes at the end for, for questions. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Dr. Dr. Harth is, is going to speak first. Sorry, Dr. Harth. Good morning. Fibromyalgia is a uh, very controversial uh, entity, and uh, to some of my colleagues, uh, it has become the F word of the turn of the century. There's some very strongly held opinions uh, on this subject. And I apologize because I will have to uh, confuse some of those who hold such opinions with some facts. Let us first start with uh, the problem of chronic widespread pain, of which fibromyalgia is uh, a, uh, uh, in which fibromyalgia belongs. And this is uh, pain which is uh, usually in the great majority of cases, musculoskeletal, and it has a very high prevalence in the uh, population. Here are some uh, figures which show uh, prevalences ranging from uh, about 9.9 percent in Israel to uh, 17 percent in Norway. There's some uh, disagreement on how this should be defined, and clearly a large number of conditions belong in this category including rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, fibromyalgia. But when all the well-defined conditions have been identified, we're still left with a large residue of patients or people who have this uh, problem and for which no specific medical diagnosis can be, uh, can be arrived at. Uh, 
women predominate uh, uh, in uh, this population. And there is an increased incidence with age, but there are some contradictory data as to whether chronic widespread pain continues to increase in prevalence or decrease, uh, decreases after the age of 65. There are a number of uh, important uh, problems associated with chronic widespread pain. Generally, these people tend to have a lower educational level, they have a lower income, they are, uh, there is a higher uh, proportion of people who are widowed or divorced, so uh, more social isolation. And uh, more recently, uh, there is a much more sinister uh, implication of chronic widespread pain in that it has been shown now, now in uh, both Scandinavia and in the United Kingdom that there is a higher incidence of cancer and cancer mortality and other causes of mortality associated with chronic <coughs> widespread pain. Uh, these are, this is mortality that occurs in, in populations with chronic widespread pain that have been followed for many years. So it isn't that one has found patients who already had cancer and had pain. Uh, chronic widespread pain occurs not only in adults but also in children. And here are the uh, results of uh, a study by uh, Mickelson and uh, his associates in Finland showing that uh, chronic widespread pain can occur in up to 7.5% of school-aged children and this uh, uh, widespread prevalence of uh, pain in ch uh, children of school age has also been recently confirmed in, the, in Great Britain. Now fibromyalgia syndrome is part of the spectrum of uh, CWP and uh, briefly it is a condition of widespread musculoskeletal pain usually associated with fatigue and a non-restorative sleep pattern. More specifically, however, it has been defined by the American College of Rheumatology uh, as fulfilling, as having to fulfill the following criteria. Uh, the uh, ACR said that in order to classify someone as having fibromyalgia, that person had to have uh, chronic pain, meaning they had to have pain for at least three months, and they had to have at least three regions of, such, of chronic pain. One of those had to be above the waist, one below the waist, one on each side of the body, and one in the center of the body. In addition, as this cartoon shows, they had to have a certain number of tender points, which are shown uh, by these red dots on these uh, uh, three young ladies. Uh, this is a cartoon of uh, French painting called The Three Graces. And these are not just tender points. These are points of pain when a certain amount of pressure is applied. And the, uh, although this is a cartoon, if one reads the original paper, it is quite clear that these points are very well defined by the uh, committee that wrote this report. So there are, there are definite surface anatomical markings uh, which, uh, which designate where these points have to be uh, elicited. Now, is this a uh, common condition? Well, here are results of a, uh, an epidemiological study which we did in, uh, in London, and you can see the uh, data. Uh, if you start at a young age, uh, people 18 to 24, you find that there is a slightly higher prevalence in men than in women, but as time goes on, and as one gets to older age groups, men reach their peak uh, prevalence uh, in, their, in the sixth decade of life, whereas women continue to show an increasing prevalence up to the age of uh, 64, after which uh, there is a decrease in prevalence, which uh, so far has remained unexplained. In the total population, uh, the prevalence in an adult population in London was 3.3%, with uh, a roughly uh, 3 to 1 ratio of women to men. In some uh, studies, the ratio uh, gets to be four to one or even five to one. And this uh, uh, prevalence, uh, this high prevalence is seen in uh, many parts of the globe. Uh, it ranges between 1.3% in Sweden, in one Swedish study, to 4.5% in Poland, 
it occurs in south africa and a large percentage of the population occurs it has been reported to occur in pakistan and about two two and a half percent of the population so somewhere between two or three percent of the population suffered from this condition now where's the problem the problem uh, at first seemed to be in the peripheral tissue in muscles and tendons and ligaments but in fact uh, although there are some data that suggest that uh, those may be abnormal most of the data uh, show that the abnormality lies in the brain and the spinal cord that is those organs which in fact allow us to sense and perceive pain uh, I'm not sure how well this projects. Uh, this is a uh, study which shows uh, a phenomenon which is called temporal summation of muscle pain. Uh, these were uh, subjects uh, with fibromyalgia in the uh, black uh, 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 squares and uh, uh, triangles here at the top. And these are uh, people who uh, are normal controls. And what has happened here is that these people were stimulated repeatedly uh, with, uh, with uh, pressure. And uh, as you may know, if you do this repeatedly, even if you, uh, the stimulus that you use is not initially painful, soon pay people will start uh, perceiving pain. And if you do that, uh, you eventually have a certain percentage of uh, people who will reach pain, even if they are quite healthy controls, but in fibromyalgics, uh, this percent the percentage of people who perceive pain uh, becomes uh, much larger as you continue to stimulate them. Uh, here is another, uh, uh, the results of another experiment. And uh, briefly, what one does, here, what, what, what uh, the investigators did here was to uh, try and fool these subjects by uh, using uh, pressure which uh, varied uh, instead of using what is usually called uh, ascending pressure, in other words, increasing the pressure with each stimulus. Uh, so this is randomly applied pressure, randomly unknown to the investigator, unknown to the patient. And again, the patients with fibromyalgia uh, would, uh, more patients with fibromyalgia with perceived pain with relatively low stimuli, uh, low weights of pressure, than people with who, uh, in the, the healthy controls. There are also some biochemical abnormalities in fibromyalgia. For instance, if you obtain uh, cerebrospinal fluid from the spinal cord uh, in patients with fibromyalgia, you find that they have a very high uh, amount of a substance which is called substance P and which uh, is uh, uh, a very uh, strongly pain-producing substance. Similarly, if you uh, look again in the cerebrospinal fluid for nerve growth factor, another pain-producing substance is present in very large amounts. Uh, on, the, uh, on the contrary, if you look for uh, substances which are known to alleviate pain, such as serotonin metabolites, you find that the patients with fibromyalgia have lower amounts in their cerebrospinal fluid than normal controls. So uh, patients with fibromyalgia have a double whammy. They have uh, more pain-producing substances and less pain-relieving substances in the uh, central nervous system. They also have other abnormalities. When challenged with uh, a uh, substance called IL-6, which causes a certain amount of stress in the body, patients with fibromyalgia will produce more noradrenaline or norepinephrine, uh, and these are data obtained from blood samples in patients with fibromyalgia versus normal controls. Uh, if you look at growth hormone levels, a growth hormone is produced in the brain, you will see that uh, the uh, upper uh, line uh, indicates growth hormone levels uh, which uh, uh, occur throughout the day in normal controls versus patients with fibromyalgia who tend to have much lower growth hormone levels. Now, people, uh, some skeptics have always said, well, you know, fibromyalgia is something that you can't really see. People say that they have pain, but how can you show that there is something wrong with them? And uh, what has happened is that with the developments in technology, such as functional MRI, you can now show that there are certain regions of the brain which light up in patients with fibromyalgia, whereas they don't light up in patients with or in normal uh, healthy controls. 
here's an experiment by a man called cook in alabama who stimulated people with fibromyalgia with various stimuli and stimulated healthy controls and these are the the white the clear rectangles here which show that if you did functional MRIs on these people their brains lit up to a much greater extent than than it would happen in healthy controls so the patient with fibromyalgia is much more susceptible to pain reacts more strongly to pain in terms of what happens to their brain stimulation and the brain is one of the organs where we perceive pain there are there are other abnormalities electro electric abnormalities patients with fibromyalgia about 50% of them have what is called a phasic alpha sleep pattern in other words as they as they go to sleep as they try to get into a deep phase of sleep where the brain waves become uh, slowed down considerably, they are jerked up and they uh, end up by sleeping, as one patient put it, as though I were sleeping at a tension throughout the night. Now, interactions in fibromyalgia, there are, as in any other condition, there are biological factors, and I've discussed those. There are social factors, and there are psychological factors. And there is considerable interaction in these, in fibromyalgia, as there is in any other condition. Fibromyalgic patients also have uh, many associated disorders, which are listed here. Chronic fatigue syndrome, which Dr. Fong will address, irritable bowel syndrome, migraine, irritable bladder, anxiety state, and depression. In fact, uh, psychological abnormalities are common in patients with fibromyalgia, whether they, are, they occur before the pain starts or after isn't clear. But uh, if you compare patients with fibromyalgia and patients with chronic widespread pain without fibromyalgia, you see there are considerable differences. This is a, a, an instrument for measuring depression. And 60% uh, of patients with fibromyalgia could be classified as depressed versus only 15% uh, with chronic widespread pain. Similarly with anxiety uh, scores, et cetera. Disability. Uh, disability is common in fibromyalgia. 31% uh, of the uh, people that we surveyed had, with fibromyalgia uh, had disability. 26% were on a disability pension versus 10.5% with chronic widespread pain versus 2.2% in the general population which served as controls. Factors impairing work function are pain, fatigue, decreased memory and concentration, which is common in fibromyalgia, and depression, anxiety if present. Now in fibromyalgia uh, and chronic widespread pain, if you try and compare the group of patients who have fibromyalgia and patients who have chronic widespread pain without fibromyalgia, you find that there are more women that have fibromyalgia than patients than, than CWP. Uh, women with uh, the people with fibromyalgia are less well educated. They have a higher number of symptoms, and they are worse than people with with chronic widespread pain in terms of pain severity, severity of fatigue and non-restorative sleep. Fibromyalgia is part of the spectrum of CWP. There shouldn't be a wall between these two. Uh, CWP is, uh, or widespread pain is a biological variable like, hyper, like blood pressure and blood sugars. And at one point, one has to use some sort of arbitrary line to separate what is abnormal from what is normal. And that is, uh, that is arbitrary, and you could argue as to whether the line should be drawn. But it is useful to have such a line because one can then concentrate on those people who are sickest and where abnormalities are likely to be greatest. One uh, word here about something that is often used in uh, litigation uh, and also uh, has become subject to some controversy in the medical profession. Uh, there are people who say that patients with fibromyalgia suffer from a somatoform disorder uh, such as hypochondriasis or hysteria or uh, other uh, entities uh, which are said to be based uh, on uh, psychological abnormalities alone without any biological uh, abnormalities. Now here is a study from Britain uh, which where they looked at patients who had no pain, who had some pain but not widespread pain and people had chronic widespread pain among whom there would be many patients with fibromyalgia. Uh, mood disorders, anxiety and uh, depression were commoner in this group. 
But when they were formally assessed by a psychiatrist for somatoform disorders, only 3% of this group has a somatoform disorder versus 1% of people had other pain and no, none in the no pain category, but only 3%. That is 97% of people who uh, had chronic widespread pain did not have a somatoform disorder, which is what many people think uh, should be the proper uh, allocation for fibromyalgia. So what I've tried to do is to bring up some facts uh, to try and uh, get away from this situation where uh, uh, people who discuss fibromyalgia tend to talk away from each other and uh, try to tr and understand uh, other people's positions, look at, the, uh, at what we uh, know occurs in fibromyalgia and see if we can arrive at some consensus, uh, both in uh, medical terms, but also in terms of uh, litigation, uh, a common ground which would accept uh, uh, what is now uh, a matter of fact. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Usher and uh, Jeffrey Lawton. Thanks for inviting me to talk to you. I don't get it get um, often invited to talk to lawyers, especially a group of lawyers. I've talked to lawyers in uh, one or two uh, cases, but I hope I'll be able to get a word in today, um, seeing the collection of the audience. Now, I'm going to use more general terms rather than specific medical terms, and I hope lawyers will take that attitude when they speak to me as well, rather than use um, legal jargon. So I'll try to restrict mine more to uh, general uh, terminology. I'm going to give you an overview rather than a lot of specificities on chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, first of all, um, let me go back to some historical perspective. This disease is not new, or this condition, whatever you want to call it. It probably exists for many centuries, but we know in the medical literature uh, there is data on a similar condition back in 1850s. Um, and it's been given different names over different times, and things have become more popular uh, now with the chronic fatigue syndrome as a terminology, but various names have been applied to this condition. Um, it is believed to be very similar to, in fact, the post-war syndrome, which was described in the Civil War in the United States, uh, post-Civil War syndrome and the Gulf War syndrome. Um, it's also been called various names like chronic brucellosis syndrome, uh, encephalomyalgic uh, encephalomyelitis, um, post-infectious myasthenia. Various names have been attached to it. Now, so currently, uh, this is a name that has become more popularized and been trying to put into vogue by the Center of Disease Control in the States to get uh, a more uniform definition and uniform criteria and to list it as a syndrome because um, there are many conditions can present similarly. Um, so it is a combination or complex of somatic syndrome, bodily symptoms that you have that makes up the chronic fatigue syndrome of unknown etiology. And it is probably an heterogeneous condition and not a homogeneous condition. So one of the major things that we have to remember, this is a disease of what we call exclusion. That means you have to exclude other conditions which can present very similarly. Now, the concept of the etiology um, has varied and there's no known cause for it right now. But there are two main groups uh, of um, thoughts. One group is that this may be a primary psychological disease and fall into the functional somatic disorders. Now the functional somatic disorders um, may include fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, the Gulf War syndrome, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, a whole host of syndrome, the uh, sick building syndrome, the hypersensitivity syndrome, um, various stress and stress disorders are, are read, uh, related. They're sort of interrelated. The other concept, um, which shouldn't, that's why I'm an infectious disease person, how, we, how do I get involved in this, was that this was a post-infectious condition. 
that there is some infectious etiology that we have not identified yet and it is to be identified in the future um, with modern techniques, but so far nobody has found a cause. Initially, in 1985, when this became popular as EB, chronic EB viral syndrome, they was found EB virus is what give rise to infectious mononucleosis. It's been found EB virus doesn't cause the syndrome. Now, the other reason why infectious disease people are invoked is that commonly, in over 50% of the cases, um, it starts like a viral infection, like a bad flu, and then it continues. So how do we make this diagnosis? What is this syndrome or complex or a mixture of symptoms? Well, um, the CDC, which is probably uh, did the, the best job on trying to make a, a group together, has put forward proposals and have revised it first in 1985 and then revised it in 1993 where the major thing is the development of recent or new chronic fatigue. And the chronic fatigue is a persistent or recurrent fatigue which is not uh, related to extreme exertion initially and not correctable. And usually it impairs the activity of the person by about 50% of their baseline. Um, and it persists for at least six months. Now the problem with this definition of, is that that's one thing where there's no other known causes. Now because this is a syndromic diseases, meaning that there's a multiple other manifestation, they list um, that they should have four other manifestation um, of a list, such as they may have myalgia, which may fit, myalgia means muscle pain, may fit fibromyalgia condition or Arthralgia, meaning joint pains, where they may have uh, multiple joint pains, or they may have post-exertional asthenia or malaise, that means after they do a little activity, they're profoundly tired or weak or unwell. And unlike most of us who may jog for a, a mile or, or play tennis and you're tired and you rest, you're better within three hours or four hours, this post-exertional uh, asthenia or malaise persists for 24 hours or more, more prolonged, more unusual. And they often have, and among the listed conditions, is Im impairment of cognition, such as impaired memory, uh, concentration, and these are things that are very common, often have impaired sleep, insomnia, and poor refreshed sleep. That means in the morning, even though they claim they sleep eight hours at night, they don't feel refreshed in the morning, as most of us will. And they often have sore throat uh, as well, or they feel like their glands are swollen in the neck and the armpits, um, the axilla, which we call lymphadenitis. They may have low-grade fever, um, and they often have um, secondary depression. The hooker to this, before you can label a patient with a diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome, we know that there are a variety of conditions that can mimic this, can produce with various components of this syndromic somatic complex. And these include, for instance, um, severe metabolic disturbances like thyroid diseases, either hyper or hypothyroid, um, very low calcium or hypercalcemia, severe diabetes mellitus, severe liver disease, severe kidney disease, a, a whole host of conditions. So one has to make sure that the patient has none of these. You have to rule out these metabolic disturbances and also rule out significant infectious diseases that can cause a syndrome, such as AIDS, for instance, or HIV infection can cause severe um, myalgia, fatigue, memory uh, impairment, and also things like chronic hepatitis B and chronic hepatitis C. So there is a whole host of conditions that we need. These patients will often be fatigued and have various components of this illness. Um, now, other people from other countries like the Canadian group and the Australian group and the English group have tried to modify the classification um, to suit their own purposes uh, a little bit, a mild modification. But intensive purposes, they're basically try doing the same and trying to make it a homogeneous group when it is really not a homogeneous group. And the major hooker to this, so one has to, to make the diagnosis, one has to do a battery of tests to rule out these conditions and generally there is no physical abnormality. 
Now, I've seen a lot of chronic fatigue syndrome. This is not my major area of research, but as I've been sent cases quite a bit, often for consultation. And although they often complain of sore throat and lymph node enlargement, you rarely ever find in the lymph node art enlargement, you rarely ever find objective evidence of severe sore throat. And although they have weaknesses, there is no, uh, they have a generalized mild weakness that you will find. You don't find paralysis. So this is not like MS. Uh, multiple sclerosis, you will find hard findings of paralysis or reflex changes or sensory changes. So generally, the examination is normal. And most and nearly all of the lab tests are normal. Now, there are various investigators that have looked at various components and say, well, is this a problem with uh, a dysauto-regulation of our immune system? Now, meaning, is, did it start with an infection or some people start with stress? Like, is this like the Gulf War syndrome or is this like your family died and there's a history of clear-cut stress and, and a high percent, and, and nearly two-thirds of the cases will have either stress or a flu-like illness. And what is it that continues to trigger these symptoms that make you feel like you have the flu? That's basically what, a bad flu that is continuing. Well, the theory is maybe it's stimulating your body, which has not been regulated, to produce immune substances, that what we call cytokines, or inflammatory cytokines, that cause the aches and the sensation of impaired memory and so forth. And they have looked for it. The problem with all these research, and they're good research been done on this topic by a wide variety of people, they're not consistent. The faint changes have not been considered. Although they are different from normal healthy controls, they are only like 30 to 40 percent of the chronic fatigue syndrome patients have been found with these abnormalities, and they're not consistent across studies. Moreover, not only can you explain that you can't explain 50 percent of the group, is that similar, similar abnormalities in the blood of, uh, uh, and also imaging. Uh, of the brain using PET scans or MRI have also been found, non-specific images. Similar syndrome have been found in stress disorders, for instance. So in anxiety, post-traumatic stress are found. So one of the problems have been they are comparing the controls to normal health of people. They're not comparing them as well um, to use as control other stress conditions to see, like work stress um, and so forth. So there's a lot of similarities. So there's no diagnostic test that you can use and say, this will pigeonhole the patient as chronic fatigue syndrome. You have to exclude other conditions. A big worry, and I think the big worry about from insurances and some laws is, this syndrome is easy to mimic. I can come to your office and say, I'm fatigued, I'm aching, I'm weak. And you cannot prove that they don't have these symptoms. So what does it mean? It means fraud can occur easily. It means that people can malinger and, and reproduce the symptomatology. And you can't prove it one way or the next. And that's the big worry. That's the big worry that we have to try and avoid. Um, now, so it depends on the consistency in the physical examination um, that one has to do. And don't forget, numerous psychological conditions can present the same. Severe, severe depression will give you similar symptoms. Uh, panic syndrome will give you severe symptoms. So what do we recommend from the diagnosis point of view? Once you have considered this diagnosis and you do a battery of blood tests and investigation to rule out other things, I don't think you should go overboard and do MRI and everybody. No, it's not necessary. You should select those who need to, to have special expensive investigation. There are a battery of routine blood tests that we'll do. But I believe uh, that everyone should have a psychiatric assessment by a psychiatrist. If cognitive impairment of that person is very prominent, which it is not in all, in some patient, that patient probably should have a detailed neuropsychological assessment. The detailed neuropsychological assessment have built-in repetition to prevent fraud, um, to see that whether it's consistent, to see whether somebody is malingering, for instance, and that's why it's helpful if that's one of their major components. So in assessing a patient disability, um, not only do we have to take what is their functional disability, 
What do they able to do on a daily basis in a routine in their homes? What can they do? But also, what uh, it may be useful is to get an official functional assessment by an occupational therapist or a kinesiologist who are used to doing these assessments that can, in fact, um, detail the amount of functional impairment um, that you need in these patients. Now, one of the things I find um, on examination of many patients, the incidence is, is similar to the fibromyalgia. It's been found that, for instance, this has been considered mainly a disease of Caucasians. Um, that's where most of the studies have been. In middle-aged women, women outnumber men by about four to seven to one. Um, but it is also found in, in, in colored races, but not been reported as much. And we're not sure if it's a reporting bias from third world countries, really ever reported. So this is a, a disease mainly being reported mostly in developing countries. Um, now, one of the problems that we find is that Patients may exacerbate their symptoms, and there is a problem with that, and this is a problem. And I think most of the time, most of the patients we think are valid, and they're not fraudulent, and they're not malingering, but there seems to be an exacerbation of symptoms um, in many of these patients. Now, I think the physician's role uh, as well has something to do with it. Um, as been uh, described, the physician, in fact, may make these patients worse and make them play a sicker role by having them <coughs> prolong bed rest. And this is what I would like to lead into the management of these patients. How do we manage these patients? The management, in fact, there's very little data on what is effective, but there's no evidence that prolonged bed rest is of value. None. And what these people need is to rehabilitate themselves. Gradual exercise activity, um, increasing graduated activity, pain medications um, to uh, combat the mu muscle aches and the arthralgia. There is an anti there is an antidepressant we use called amitriptyline or nortriptyline, which is good for chronic pain syndromes, or many chronic pain syndromes that was often used to help control symptoms. And probably one of the most useful uh, things that we have found and recently in numerous studies and meta-analyses is a treatment that is used by psychiatrists for depression called cognitive behavior therapy. There's consistent data. All the studies, or nearly all the studies, intensive cognitive behavior therapy for at least three months is of benefit. Um, and this is what we would recommend in many patients. Now, the prognosis is variable, and you cannot predict which patients. But one of the things is to advise these patients to gradually get back into activity, gradually even part-time. Because one of the worst things I feel is to keep an open mind and tell the patients that we don't know what causes this condition. Not to label them. I think it's a bad thing to label them often. And I often worry about the label, even of chronic fatigue syndrome. Leave it open. It's a condition we don't know what's causing it. Uh, we don't know for sure with the, the molecular basis has not been understood but to explain to patients that we don't believe if we, um, that they're making it up. To tell patients that's in their mind is the wrong thing, that they're making it up. And people hate to be labeled as uh, psychiatric patients, um, but there is a close link. And where is the link from? And I'll just finish. The link is your nerves, your hormones, your, what we call your, your, your cytokines that fight infection, uh, are all regulated from the brain. The input from the cerebrum affects the hypothalamus, um, which is one of the major control, which controls your autonomic nervous system, controls your adrenal glands, and, and controls part of your immunity. And it's all linked. And this is what I'd like to leave the word today. That this condition, we need to know a lot more, and uh, we don't know enough, uh, but it's de debilitating to the patient. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Fong, and thanks again to uh, Dr. Harth. Um, we did start a bit late this morning, but um, I'd like to, to try to allow just maybe two questions. Um, so if we, could, if we could first of all go to uh, the London site and just find out if anyone in London has a question. Any questions in London? Yeah. 
Everybody's everybody's stunned by the last two speakers. So far, there's no no questions there. How about? Oh, there is. Uh, there's one. There's one in Toronto. Okay. Sure. If if you could go to the mic, that would be helpful great. to the people out of, out of Toronto. Where I'm supposed to look? Is there a camera? Or no. okay. <laughs> um, I just uh, want to thank, in particular, the first speaker um, for his observations and comments, and just wondered. I I do know that there is um, a, a method, a diagnostic tool that can be used, which is checking the 18 tender points, uh, which you had referred to, and um, just want to see if you could comment on that further. Um, I'm aware of Dr. Hugh Smythe's research and, and materials and uh, um, in, the, and in recommending that the uh, 18 tender points, as they're referred to, um, do provide an actual uh, uh, practical and physiological uh, means to diagnose uh, fibromyalgia. I wonder if you could elaborate upon that. Um, and as well, the fact that although certain medications, as Dr. Fong recommended, have uh, been suggested, um, from my own experience, I know that uh, they are not, uh, they do not function across the board for all patients with fibromyalgia. And I wonder if you could elaborate upon that. Um, there's no one medication that I think can be referred to as being uh, the great uh, panacea for, for recovery of fibromyalgia. Thank you very much. And, and was your question directed specifically to Dr. Harth? Or, yeah, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. With respect to the uh, first point uh, the questioner uh, made, the uh, American College of Rheumatology classification criteria require that uh, there be at least 11 of those so-called tender points, or in fact painful points, present in order to make the diagnosis or to, to uh, come up with the uh, classification of fibromyalgia. And these points were uh, obtained by a group of, uh, by numerous investigators that eventually had to come to some consensus as to how many uh, points had to be elicited in order to uh, support the diagnosis. Insofar as, the, as medications are concerned, uh, I agree that uh, we don't have any very good medications number of uh, medications that have been used, amitriptyline, cyclobenzaprine, which is flexural, which is a muscle relaxant, uh, some of the uh, antidepressants, serotonin, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and so on. And none of these work very well for a very long time. And interestingly, I would agree with Dr. Fong that as cognitive behavioral therapy uh, tends to work well uh, or better than other things in uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. So it works uh, better, I think, than numerous medications. It's not a cure, but it does make many patients feel better. And coupled with cognitive behavioral therapy uh, is uh, improvement in fitness achieved through exercise. So uh, those things are useful, but uh, unfortunately useful only for as yet a minority of patients. We still need much better treatments. Thanks very much, Dr. Harth. I think we should, we should move on to the next uh, section. And there, there, there will be, I apologize to those that may still have questions, but we'll try to get um, some time later in the day where we can, we can squeeze in some more questions. Thanks very much, Dr. Fong. Um, in our, in our next section, uh, we're going to deal with, with the evolving roles of psychiatry in assessing and treating uh, these various conditions. And we have with us today uh, Dr. Susan Abbey and Dr. Sherwood Appleton and Dr. Daryl Appleton. And what, uh, what I think maybe they should do is 
just come up here and, and find a, a seat, and you can all sit up here at the same time while I'm uh, introducing you. Uh, each, each of our speakers this morning is going gonna, is gonna to, again, have about 12 minutes to speak, following which uh, we'll try to, uh, again, reserve 10 minutes for questions, uh, if, if we can. Dr. Uh, Dr. Susan Abbey, over to uh, Hugh's left, uh, is the Director of Medical Psychiatry at the University Health Network and an Associate Professor in Psychiatry at the University of Toronto. She is also a consultant to the U.S. Uh, Centers for Disease Control with respect to chronic fatigue syndrome. Dr. Sherwood Appleton, sitting directly to my left, uh, is the Medical Director of Appleton Sleep Clinics and the Brain and Sleep Diagnostic Center. Uh, his areas of practice are neuropsychiatry and sleep medicine, and he is an associate psychiatrist uh, with the Department of Psychiatry at Toronto General Hospital, University of Toronto. Uh, the younger Dr. Appleton uh, is, is at my far left. Dr. Daryl Appleton is co-founder of the Appleton Sleep Clinics and is also an associate of the uh, Brain and Sleep Diagnostic Center and he practices in the area of neuropsychiatry, sleep medicine, psychopharmacology, I believe, I believe uh, is the term. That's it. And again, uh, there's more detailed information in, in, in each of the, the doctor's bios. So um, perhaps if Dr. Abby, if you could start us off. Sure, uh, standing up or sitting down? It's, it's up to you, your preference. Where are my slides? Somebody was gonna help me get those. What I was going to start off by saying is when I give a talk to uh, family doctors or to medical specialists, the first question I ask is, how many people here believe in chronic fatigue syndrome? And get people to hold up little, you know, like, do you think of primary care, five minute primary care? I said yes, and about, you know, a third of the hands went up, but I said, you know, who doesn't believe? And another third of the hands went up. And I said, who, uh, you've got some more little things in your uh, bag, who thinks this is a stupid question? And about two hands went up, and I was very disappointed because about a third of them should there would have been no other diagnosis uh, that would have been heard about at that meeting that people would have had a belief about. You know, do you believe in hypertension? Do you believe in rheumatoid arthritis? But I think that that's very much a part of the whole chronic uh, fatigue syndrome fibromyalgia area. When we got together, we weren't very well organized because I think none of us specifically talked about chronic pain, so I've put that in, in brackets, but I am going to talk about uh, chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. A copy of my uh, notes will be sent out to everybody. For simplicity's sake today, to not have a whole bunch of really busy slides, I, um, I ha haven't put the references in, but when you get the, the copies, the references will be in so you can know where to go. Uh, I also thought I should dis disclose my potential conflicts of interest so that you can weigh my presentation accordingly. I'm a consultant on an advisory board for three pharmaceutical companies. I consult to Odyssey Health Services, which provides intensive rehabilitation services, sometimes for people with these diagnoses, and I'm a consultant for the uh, United States CDC. By the end of my Fast Talkers of North America presentation, I hope you'll have some basic understanding of roughly what the psychiatry thinks, although it's probably more this psychiatrist than, and that's the trouble for you as, uh, as litigators is that there are so many different opinions and to try to get a rational opinion that you can put forward can be difficult. And to talk a little bit about effective management. Now, I think psychiatrists can do a lot of things. I think we can help to ensure people have had appropriate medical workups. In um, my CDC studies, 10 to 15% of the population uh, that we have studied have not had appropriate medical evaluations done. So they've complained of fatigue and haven't had a thyroid uh, function test done. It's, I mean, it's outrageous. We can encourage people to have optimal functioning. We can treat their comorbid axis one disorders, DSM-4 axis one disorders, things like depression and anxiety, provide symptomatic treatment around sleep and fatigue, and assist in rehabilitation planning. Now just in terms of the basics. We've talked about this. I think that understanding the social context is really important and that patients can be damaged by either uh, pole, by people who um, insist that uh, there are no such diagnosis, they devalue their experiences and they make them worse and keep them sick longer. And at the other end, there are um, physicians who tell them that this is hopeless and they're going to be damaged forever and they're going to be sick and they should just go home and rest forever. 
The problem always is that it's an issue of symptoms and disorders. All of these symptoms are continuously dis distributed. If we look at tender points, everybody in this room probably has one tender point. The decision to make it 11 out of 18 tender points was a consensus decision. The way in which the chronic fatigue syndrome criteria, I sat on that panel, it was wacky. It was, again, a kind of consensus decision amongst people often who had vested interests. And trying to um, accept these diagnoses is real, the suffering is real, have some etiologic neutrality, and then have an integrative treatment perspective. I had to include this quote from my friend Peter, uh, Michael Sharp and Peter O'Malley. CFS, FMS, and other somatic symptom-defined syndromes are conditions whose homes in medicine, as functional syndromes, and in psychiatry, as somatoform disorders, are both rather temporary structures located in unfashionable areas of their respective communities. Are they one disease or two? Well, the one study that has been done using 600 patients showed that there was not an ability to distinguish between uh, these diagnoses. They're associated with other symptom-defined conditions. We've heard about irritable bowel syndrome, temporomandibular joint syndrome, and associated with psychiatric disorder. What does the association with psychiatric disorder mean? Well, I think it means that there's a treatable area that we can do something about. Um, I don't agree. I think often uh, the perspective from internists is when psychiatrists talk, they're devaluing these conditions, but there is a physiology that underlies psychiatric conditions, and they don't happen through the vapors or the ether. There, there's a biology and a pathophysiology. There's considerable variation across studies in prevalence rates. So some studies will have very high prevalence rates of psychiatric disorders and some very low. And that really has a lot to do about where the studies are held, uh, what kind of inclusion and exclusion criteria people have. We do know that the more symptoms people have, the more physical symptoms they have, the more likely it is that they have a psychiatric disorder. So when you've got somebody who's got chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel, TMJ, they're much more likely to have a coexistent psychiatric disorder than somebody with only one of those diagnoses. That there are also increased rates of access to diagnosis of personality disorder diagnosis, which makes work sometimes with these groups quite challenging. And there are a number of hypotheses about the overlap. So it may be that, in fact, these are two distinct syndromes. And if you had a syndrome which was poorly understood, devalued, and you know, had pejorative uh, sort of connotations, you'd be depressed too. You know, on the other hand, it may well be that um, biological disorders and serotonin pathways that are associated with anxiety and panic disorders also feed uh, pain perception and sleep. So it's a quite a complicated um, interrelationship. The precise etiology remains unknown. There are a wide range of etiologic factors have been proposed. And one thing that really is hard and you don't want to hear, but the research is extremely poor in this area. Poorly defined samples, often with insufficient power to detect differences, and often um, without appropriate control. So findings that when you then control by having people who are deconditioned, people who are depressed, uh, you know, people the same age or whatever, you, the findings disappear. The other important thing from a treatment perspective is that precipitating factors don't equal perpetuating factors. We know in terms of predisposing, there seems to be a genetic vulnerability, and that from a biological basis, infection and injury may lead to the syndrome's onset. There's some question about immunologic factors perpetuating, although the studies that are the most scientifically rigorous, which would be expected to find, most likely to find data, you know, supporting immunologic dysregulation actually don't show it. I think there's clear evidence around physiologic deconditioning. Sleep abnormalities we're going to hear about, but I think it's quite interesting. There's just been a recent publication looking at a group of twins, monozygotic, same genetic uh, structure twins, one of whom has chronic fatigue syndrome and one of whom doesn't. They are exactly similar in their sleep, apart from some minor respiratory abnormalities. And so some of the findings that seem to be associated with chronic fatigue syndrome may be more about uh, sort of genetic approaches to sleep and don't account for all the difference in the disorders. Neuroendocrine changes that have been touted a lot when they're looked at in large series either don't hold up or seem to be associated with deconditioning and psychiatric disorders. Uh, blood pressure regulation, so the sleep lab, uh, the tilt table tests aren't holding up. We know something about personality, tend to be type A overachievers who have abnormal activity patterns of uh, overactivity usually. Uh, typically histories of much higher rates of histories of uh, physical and sexual abuse, particularly in childhood, but also sometimes in adulthood. Interestingly, we think of this as being kind of yuppie uh, disorders, but in population studies, it's lower socioeconomic status and poor educational attainment that are associated with them. And they're often precipitated by situations of life stress, but a particular type of life stress, one in which you're facing two 
rotten alternatives. So not good life stresses, but two rotten alternatives. There's good evidence now, I think, that illness beliefs, catastrophizing, uh, illness attributions are negative. In chronic fatigue syndrome, patient support groups are a negative prognostic factor, delegitimizing healthcare professionals and disability pensions. The prognosis is variable with a chronic but fluctuating course. About 50% of people have a complete remission in two to three years in population-based studies. Of course, they haven't gotten into the clutches of medicine and the law, so <laughs> I think those are two factors that are often associated with poor outcome. The criteria you've heard about, and it's important just because there are also exclusion criteria related to psychiatric uh, diagnoses that may be confounded. It's important to look for the medical issues from a psychiatric standpoint to make sure somebody has attended to those to have appropriate screening activities. Sleep studies, you're going to hear more about. They may be useful in diagnosing primary sleep disorders and in documenting sleep status. But sleep abnormalities do not uh, necessarily equal disability and symptoms may or may not improve if the sleep abnormalities improve with treatment. As a psychiatrist, I'm going to be looking for mood, for anxiety disorders, panic, generalized anxiety disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder. Somatoform disorders, Dr. Harth made a point that they're only 3%, th but that's about you know, 300 times the rate in the general population. So, so the door, and if they're there, we want to know about them because uh, they're long-standing and they're not going to be particularly treatable. Substance abuse is important. Now, just to end off, a quick uh, view around management. I think the central issue is hurt versus harm. And there really is absolutely no scientific evidence whatsoever that we can permanently damage people, uh, harm them through rehabilitation. They may hurt, and, and that may be something that we have to help them through, but there's no evidence that we're going to harm them. We need to treat what's treatable, including medical causes of fatigue, depression, anxiety, sleep, and optimized function. Help people to take an active role in their self-management, look at self-medication. Many of these patients have been vastly over-medicated, uh, particularly the fibromyalgia patients. They're taking, I saw a lady in assessment who was taking nearly a thousand milligram equivalents of morphine a day. You know, to me it was amazing. She was up and breathing, you know. Um, it, it, so really inappropriate uh, polypharmacy. Help people to move towards standard sleep and wake times, get their chronobiology back, get some structured activity so they're doing a little bit of something every day rather than a lot one day and then nothing for three weeks, and continually returning to this hurt versus harm. Addressing salient psychological issues, catastrophizing uh, isn't helpful, self-efficacy, taking active uh, part in their life, stopping avoidance, and stopping symptom monitoring. Daryl's going to talk a little bit about uh, pharmacologic treatments. I think you want to specify the target. What is it that you're trying to treat? There are mixed results with antidepressants. There certainly isn't a magic bullet, uh, but there are studies that show that these drugs can be helpful, probably more helpful in fibromyalgia than in chronic fatigue syndrome, but again, problems around experimental design and inadequate powering. Cognitive behavior therapy is the new exciting kid on the block. Um, it's not used only for depression, but for a whole range of disorders now, and it basically looks at people's thoughts about their disorders and their behavior. Individually administered CBT has been found helpful in about two-thirds of patients treated in three trials, and that's using mental health professionals trained in CBT. There have been negative studies in uh, both the Netherlands and in the UK for uh, GP-administered. Uh, CBT, but they're really inadequate duration. They were like six or seven sessions of 30 minutes, so you're not going to do much for folks in those. Graded physical exercise, there, I don't have, I'm sorry, a slide on the FM trials, but in CFS there are four high quality trials. Most recent publication, Andrew Lloyd, who used to be uh, 10 years ago when we'd go for drinks, said it's all, you know, your wrong season, your wrong season, it's all in the immune system, is now, you know, departing from that view, and he's written a paper titled To Exercise or Not to Exercise in Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, No Longer a Question, that now that there is sufficient high-quality scientific evidence that a graded exercise program should be part of people's management. Um, people should get individual exercise prescriptions, primary care practitioner may be the exercise therapist, the mental health uh, care practitioner, a kinesiologist, a cognitive behavioral uh, psychologist, but basically people need to start lower and go slower. So you have to get them to start with something that they can do on their worst day. So if on my worst day I could walk, you know, from here to that microphone, then I'm going to do that every day. And then next week I'll walk to the end of the table every day, and then I'll walk halfway down. And it'll take me maybe a month to walk to the wall, but I'll be doing that five or six days a week. And I'll continue to increase in that way over three, six, nine, twelve months until I'm at a point where I'm getting aerobic conditioning. 
and just to end off comprehensive rehab programs, they should be multidisciplinary, treatment in the patient's home, graded exercise, activity regulation, cognitive therapy, and I think the average is around six to ten months of treatment for patients beginning with two sessions per week. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Adam. Uh, before I begin and introduce you to a relatively new medical field, uh, the field of sleep medicine, sleep disorders, I uh, just wanted to assure you that anyone who falls asleep uh, during my presentation should know after I talk where to go to get a consultation. Uh, now, uh, sleep disorders are very, very common in medical practice. After all, sleep occupies one-third of our whole life. And sleep can be blissful, but sleep can also be very dangerous. Um, we've all heard about certain catastrophes, such as Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, uh, Challenger Space Shuttle, and Exxon Valdez. If you don't know, what all these disasters have in common is that they were all due to sleep disorders. Disorders such as sleep apnea or insufficient sleep and sleep deprivation from insomnia and also from shift work disorders. Conditions which cause persons to nod off or fall asleep and have accidents while driving or working. In the last six or seven years, besides psychiatry, I've been uh, assessing and sleeping, uh, assessing and treating, <laughs> sleeping too, uh, sleep disorders and assisting with medical legal reports, mainly in the northern Toronto suburb of Thornhill and also in our downtown Toronto office. Today, because of so little time to cover such a broad field, from psychiatry to sleep medicine to pain and fatigue, I can only provide a basic primer on this vast new field, which contains some new insights and strategies. Now, a typical sleep center is staffed mainly by either respirality, that's a chest specialist, or an ear, nose, and throat specialist. Their patients are usually referred for treatment of snoring and breathing-related sleep disorders such as sleep apnea, which are sometimes seen in pain and fatigue. Um, at our clinic, we work closely in the assessment and treatment of these conditions with our respirology and ear, nose, and throat and neurology colleagues. However, uh, pain and fatigue patients are a very specialized group and usually have one or more of these presenting symptoms. Pain is usually the result of accidents such as MVAs and or fibromyalgia. Headaches, sleep disorders can be of varying, varying, varying uh, types. Fatigue, we see uh, fatigue of varying degrees. Some can be very severe, like in uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. But fatigue in general have to, has to be differentiated from sleepiness and alertness problems with specific rating scales and daytime studies. If post-traumatic daytime sleepiness is, is present, narcolepsy must be ruled out. A key finding in this pain and fatigue group, according to sleep medicine specialists in their neuropsychiatry and sleep medicine, is that the majority of various uh, conditions other than snoring and uh, sleep apnea. Okay. 
Uh, in fact, the most, the, most of the pain and fatigue group have an insomnia disorder. By this, I don't mean the usual definition of insomnia is merely difficulty falling asleep. In the sleep field, we conceptualize insomnia more broadly as difficulties with sleep in all parts of the night. Before, before exploring insomnias, let me review sleep stages. Okay, now sleep is made up of two uh, distinct states. First, um, where's that little? Thing? Uh, first, uh, it's not showing on the thing. Wait a second. No. Sorry, we're having a little technical difficulty. Okay, anyway, I'll go on anyway. Uh, it's, uh, there's two distinct stage states. Uh, the first is non-REM or non-dream sleep, and the second is dream sleep or REM, which is rapid eye movement sleep. Non-REM sleep is further divided into four stages. Stages one and two comprise light sleep, a very shallow, just beneath the surface sleep, which forms a small majority of our sleep but is not considered an essential healthy sleep. Stages three and four together are called deep sleep, delta sleep, or slow wave sleep, and this is the restorative sleep stage that we all need. This is a stage in which our vital organs and immune systems basically are replenished. So basically our batteries are recharged or our gas tanks are refilled. And we need 20 to 25% of this healthy sleep to function. REM sleep, dream sleep, uh, should be about 20% of our sleep. It usually follows slow wave sleep and is important for memory consolidation. Insomnias are classified as initial maintenance and terminal insomnias, also called early, middle, or late insomnias, depending on state of, stage of the night that they occur. Now, initial insomnias are those with difficulty in falling asleep. In pain disorders, such as MVAs and fibromyalgia, this is due to trying to sleep with constant pain and discomfort. Now, note that most pain med medications are given for daytime use only, but pain impulses don't fall asleep at night. Pain stays to disrupt our sleep unless it has helped to go to sleep. So we try to help doctors even pain clinics understand that patients with severe pain usually need nighttime pain medications to help them sleep. And if a client tells you that pain interrupts their sleep, it's pretty important to get them checked out. We also see difficulty falling asleep with restless leg syndrome. These are uncontrollable urges to move one's legs or unpleasant leg situations which delay the onset of sleep. As psychiatrists, we see difficulty falling asleep with racing thoughts and stress and anxiety disorders or as part of depression. Note that features of depression can be determined on sleep studies. Maintenance insomnias are difficulties in staying asleep. These usually lead to sleep fragmentation or interruption of sleep continuity and caused by the following events during sleep. First are arousals. Nocturnal arousals are abrupt changes in sleep stages in which we don't usually um, fully awaken, but they're associated with changes in heart rate, breathing, or body movements. And the amount of arousals per hour, known as the arousal index, is increased in insomnia, usually to 10 or 20 arousals per hour or more, which means a sleep disruption every three to six minutes or less. Okay, there are, are three main types of arousals that are recorded on a sleep study, all of which interfere with restorative sleep. 
The first, the periodic limb movement arousals, which occur in periodic limb movement disorder. This is a common, serious, involuntary disorder with episodic jerking of one's legs, body or arm movements, which is often aggravated by stress. The second are respiratory arousals, which are due to factors such as snoring and sleep apnea. And the third are spontaneous arousals, which are increased in patients with pain and fatigue, and also in psychiatric disorders such as depression. Continuing with the maintenance arousals, night awakenings are usually increased in maintenance insomnias, and alpha intrusions are a special finding on a sleep study. Here, alpha waves intrude into and interfere with restorative sleep, and the specific pattern is often seen in fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue, and corroborates the presence of dysfunctional sleep and fatigue. So it's clear that all these events cause non-refreshing or non-restorative sleep. As a result of arousals and awakenings and or alpha intrusions, pain in fibromyalgia patients are sleep deprived and exhausted, may have increased muscle spasm and difficulties in healing, information processing and concentration. Also note that certain medications, such as most antidepressants, Valium type drugs and alcohol often decrease needed restorative and dream sleep. And most antidepressants, coffee and nicotine worsen periodic limb movement disorder. Terminal insomnia or early morning awakening is often seen where there's associated depression or in the elderly. Just a brief word about treatment of insomnias in pain and fatigue. Uh, treatment is usually individualized and dependent upon what is revealed in the patient's history, rating scales, and sleep studies, and also what other coexisting psychiatric or medical disorders are present. We're very careful about medications used and sometimes have to help change the existing uh, medications. Uh, some were referred to earlier uh, as problem by Dr. Abbey. Uh, we use uh, many of the treatments used include sleep hygiene, which has been mentioned, individual and group psychotherapy, including cognitive behavioral therapy, interpersonal therapy, relaxation techniques, biofeedback, personal trainers, neuropsych testing is very, very important in all this, and whatever works, including safe hypnotics. Um, follow-up is essential. So in summary, pain and fatigue patients may have excessive daytime sleepiness and insomnia, but much more commonly, initial and maintenance insomnia. Sleep, study, sleep studies can help by documenting a number of indicators. And you'll see on the slide some sleep study findings in chronic pain, fibromyalgia, and chronic fatigue, which include increased arousals, awakenings, alpha intrusions, increased when they're present, uh, increased stages one and two, that's light sleep, and decreased or absent stages three and four, restorative sleep, and REM sleep, and sleep efficiency and sleep duration. We also see delayed sleep onset in initial insomnia when people are having difficulty going to sleep and delayed REM or dream sleep onset, uh, particularly with certain medications. This is also true of uh, the decrease in REM sleep. Um, so the sleep disorders in chronic pain, fibromyalgia, and chronic fatigue include insomnias, periodic limb movement disorder, restless leg syndrome, sleep apnea, and other disorders such as nocturnal epilepsy, nocturnal asthma, parasomnias, which are just unusual behaviors at night, circadian rhythm disorders like shift work disorders, narcolepsy, and so on, and many, many more.
Now, just three quick points and strategies to remember for your pain and fatigue clients. If they have chronic pain, including from car accidents, fiber, or fatigue, have definite sleep difficulties, and have not yet had a sleep study, it's probably a good idea for you to help them to get one. If they have had a sleep study in a history of excessive daytime sleepiness, do not have sleep apnea, they very well may have another sleep disorder, including insomnia. If they have had a sleep study, do not have sleep apnea, but still have ongoing insomnia, exhaustion and fatigue, go to a sleep clinic that can evaluate this, including arranging a medical workup with specialists. Finally, a checklist of insider tips for lawyers and insurance companies. This is an insider's guide to checking out which sleep clinics are best for assessment of chronic pain, fibromyalgia, and chronic fatigue, and obtaining sensible sleep study reports. So insider tip one, as the most common sleep disorder in pain and fatigue is not snoring or sleep apnea, but insomnia. Check whether the sleep clinic has specialists in insomnia. Insider tip two, all sleep clinics are not the same. Most sleep clinics have only one or two medical specialties. Check whether the sleep clinic is a multi-specialty sleep clinic. Insider tip three, Follow-up is critical. Check whether your clients will be followed up regularly during the course of their assessment and treatment for how long and how often. This is very, very important. So again, this is not always the case. Patients need ongoing support, monitoring, and follow-up sleep studies to check changes in sleep events and symptoms. We're almost finished. Insider tip number four. Check whether the sleep clinic assists lawyers and insurers by providing understandable and useful medical legal reports. And finally, cider tip number five, check whether the sleep specialist is caring, empathic, and supportive to your clients. A vital role for any doctor, and certainly a psychiatrist and sleep specialist, is to assist the person in coping with the subjective stress of these ongoing disorders, especially in validating that their pain and fatigue and sleep problem is real. Just the simple support can lessen the patient's stress and subsequent symptoms by treating them in a non-judgmental way with sincere respect and dignity. Thank you again for inviting me here. I hope you've learned a little bit more about the importance of sleep disorders and sleep studies for your clients. I wish that my presentation may add, may add to your repertoire for litigating or defending your cases. And if it will, I hope it will then cont contribute to your peace of mind and result in what my classmate, Dr. Hart, has also said is result in continued and restful, refreshing, dreamful, and restorative sleep. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Appleton. Now, Dr. Uh, Daryl Appleton. Thanks very much. Hi, hello, everybody. Uh, I'd like to mention that it's uh, often very difficult for me to follow in my father's footsteps, but I'll do my best. Okay, uh, today I'm going to do my uh, imitation of uh, Dr. Abby. I'm going to try and speak very quickly so we can try and rush through this. We're a little bit behind here. So uh, what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about uh, the aforementioned comorbidities between chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, talk a little bit uh, briefly about some of the rating scales that we'd like to use which are useful, and uh, talk a little bit about psychopharmacology. So first to start off with, uh, some of the studies have shown that there's a very high comorbidity between chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. In fact, uh, when you take a look here at the statistics, uh, you'll see that um, there's between 20 and 70 percent of people with fibromyalgia that also meet criteria for fatigue, and conversely, about 35 to 70 percent uh, going the other way. So uh, obviously, there's a lot of difficulty. You know, as a psychiatrist, uh, I'm often asked to see patients with chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, people with chronic pain, and sort of asked, you know, how can you help tease apart what component is so-called psychiatric? And conversely, as a sleep specialist with a psychiatric background, I'm also asked the same thing. When people have difficulties with their sleep, can you please tell me, you know, is it possible that they're depressed or anxious and help me deal with this? So. 
I'd like to talk first about the fact that there is some evidence to show that chronic fatigue and depression are in fact separate entities. Um, and here's some of the things that we have. Number one, uh, some of the symptoms of chronic fatigue syndrome that are endorsed by the patients, uh, such as sore throat, adenopathy, which is you know, the, the soreness that they report, arthralgias, post-exertional fatigue, are not really typical of, of what we have as a normal psychiatric patient coming in with depression. Um, they don't usually endorse the typical uh, sort of symptoms that we see in someone who is really chronically depressed, um, which is like the feelings of hopelessness, the guilt, uh, anhedonia means the inability to experience pleasure and the, the motivational issues. Um, this is a little bit of uh, medical speak, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are some uh, abnormalities starting at the brain which affect some of our hormone levels. And in fact, one thing that I found interesting was that in chronic fatigue syndrome, um, the end result in a lot of studies is that we find uh, central upregulation of uh, the HPA axis. I'm not going to get into details. And people with depression usually have the opposite. Typical sleep abnormalities that my father um, sort of mentioned, um, people uh, usually have issues that are a lot more easy to pick up when someone's depressed. Very often we can, we can sort of pick up a depression early, even before they're able to describe their psychological symptoms. And you see sort of uh, pathognomonic signs on a sleep study. And uh, there's certain things that we also find that are correlated with people with chronic fatigue, as well as trauma and, and uh, stressful situations. Antidepressants, as mentioned, they're not the panacea. They don't work for all of our conditions. Um, and of course, they don't work perfectly in depression either, but we have a much better rate of, a, of treating depression. Um, but it only works, you know, very rarely. Um, as mentioned, you're very sensitive to the serotonergic antidepressants in chronic fatigue. And in fibromyalgia, only about a quarter or so of the people really respond. Many patients with chronic fatigue syndrome have had no history of depression at any time in their life. And in those that do, it, you can't always describe you know, the temporal s sequence. I is it a reactive depression because they're so fatigued and are having such difficulties? Or you know, it's the chicken or the egg. It's very difficult to sort of uh, tease apart. Um, one point that I think is interesting to make is that when we do research studies and, and when we're looking at epidemiology or statistics of when diseases occur um, in the population, very often, they're done um, through research studies by using particular uh, schedules. And of course, you can understand it's expensive to run studies using psychiatrists or psychologists to do full, long-winded clinical interviews. Um, I, one of the things that's interesting is that when you use uh, a lay interviewer uh, using something called a diagnostic interview schedule, we tend to find a lower correlation of depression um, than excuse me, a higher correlation. They attribute a lot more of fatigue and things like this towards depression than you do when you have studies that are done using longer clinician-based scales. Um, in our practice, we like to use scales as much as possible. We try to be as objective as possible. Understanding that as, as, a, as a physician, you're always trying to be uh, supportive and you have that, uh, you know, that therapeutic relationship with someone, but you need to try and be as objective as possible. And we try to use as many scales as well as questionnaires as possible. And we also attempt to use objective ones when possible. It's not always possible. Um, we use something called the fatigue assessment instrument, the fibro fatigue scale. Uh, the pain visual analog scales for chronic pain, the Center for Epidemiological Studies depression scale, the Hamilton uh, depression scale, the Beck anxiety inventory, the Toronto alexithymia scale, and the Epworth sleepiness scale. Let me briefly, um, in the interest of time, just tell you what alexithymia really is because a lot of people aren't really aware of that, that sort of construct and, and I think it might be useful. Um, it's a multi-dimensional construct which is defined by difficulty in identifying and describing their feelings. Uh, it's difficulty in distinguishing between the feelings and body sensations, um, having a paucity of fantasies, an externally focused cognitive style. I know this sounds like mumbo jumbo, but basically, when you give these scales, they tend to be correlated a lot with somatoform disorders and people that have depression. And I find it very useful um, you know, in our clinic to use this. It gives us a heads up towards some of the uh, attributional styles towards their illness. Um, sleepiness, the Epworth sleepiness scale is sort of, 
you know, a, a scale which is used to sort of assess the uh, excessive daytime sleeping that someone feels in their life, usually secondary to uh, difficulties with their sleep. And as my, my father mentioned, there's quite a lot of insomnia. I'm sure if I was to ask how many people have had insomnia in their life, put up your hand, please, if anyone's ever had insomnia. Thank you. All right. Of course, in our fields, you know, we tend to have study a lot, have a lot of stress too. So, um, one thing that was very interesting is that very often when, when you have them do the st when you have them fill out the scales, they'll have a really high number. And then you'll what I find is really important is when you're in the clinical interview with them and you go over it with them, you always have difficulties differentiating. You know, is it really sleepiness or is it fatigue? And that's really one of the main issues that I wanted to look at. These are the major issues that as a psychiatrist we have difficulties differentiating. Is it sleepiness versus fatigue? Is it sleepiness versus the ability to maintain alertness? Is it a lack of energy versus a lack of motivation? And this is where I feel there's a real, um, uh, there's an ability to help differentiate at least the sleepiness and fatigue issue, not just from subjective scales, but let's look at something a little more objective, which is more useful. You know. It's difficult to fake your brain waves. I don't know too many people who are able to do that. So we look at daytime studies during the day. They're not done at very many labs. And um, there's two different types of tests. And briefly, the multiple sleep latency test, you put someone in a room during the daytime and you sort of assess how long does it take them to fall asleep, can they nap, these sorts of things. How sleepy are they during the day? The maintenance of wakefulness test is the opposite. You, during the daytime, after a sleep study, you put them into a chair and you say, try and stay awake and see if they have the ability to stay awake. Just a brief comment on polypharmacy. Um, polypharmacy is a major issue that um, do Dr. Abby alluded to, and uh, we see this all the time. It's a real problem. A lot of us are on um, a number of medications. Certainly the people with the issues of chronic pain, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, it's a real issue. And uh, you know, about 180,000 people have been reported to die in the United States as a result of drug-related injuries. This far exceeds mortality rate of about 45,000 due to automobile accidents. You know, um, there's obviously longer hospital stays, potential liability to hospitals and healthcare professionals. I don't want to be uh, charged with any malpractice. And um, we need to all understand and recognize potential drug interactions. Uh, one of the things that I didn't mention was um, I'll just briefly mention this is one, and then I'm going to end in the interest of time. But uh, very often, we, we, we've heard people use medications such as Elevil, which is an older style of uh, antidepressant. It's been used in the pain field quite often. It attacks a particular neurotransmitter or chemical in the brain, which we believe is modulating some of the pathways, um, called norepinephrine. And uh, one of the points I want to make is that you always have to look at the whole picture of the patient. They cause difficulties with sleep as well in terms of altering some of the sleep architecture. And there's some promise in some of the newer medications uh, which may improve the quality of sleep as well as targeting some of these pathways. And uh, we're doing a lot of work on that. So in summary here, there's a high comorbidity between the two syndromes, makes it difficult to tease apart the difficulties. We need to try and identify the psychiatric components of these illnesses and, of course, treat them using a multifactorial, multidisciplinary approach. Using psychotherapy, we use uh, groups and individual psychotherapy in addition. Um, the importance of using objective and subjective scales and tests when, it, when at all possible to help differentiate, rule out malingering, look at issues such as this. The utility of using daytime sleep studies for assessing sleepiness versus alertness, how does this impact upon their function, functional ability to work, and really it's a real issue with looking at the total picture of polypharmacy and trying to take away sometimes makes people better rather than adding. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Appleton. Um, we are scheduled for a coffee break, but what I was going to suggest was if you can bear with me for just a couple of minutes, we'll maybe see if there are a couple of questions at some of the remote sites, um, and then we'll just bump the coffee break a little bit so that we'll, we'll have a coffee break till uh, 11 o'clock or so. so. So maybe if we could just check in with Niagara on the Lake uh, to see whether there are any questions there. That, that makes it simple. Okay, may, maybe we'll go to uh, Ottawa. Can we check in, in Ottawa? Are there any questions in Ottawa? No questions. 
No questions in Ottawa. Well, we're, we're on a roll, so we'll try Sudbury. No questions here. Is, is there anyone in Sudbury? <laughs> Any questions in Sudbury? No? No, thank you. Okay. Um, let's just go to Thunder Bay and then uh, see if anybody in Thunder Bay has a question. Anyone there? No? Okay. In that case, let's, uh, let's go to the coffee break. <laughs> let's, uh, let's try to be back by 11 o'clock and uh, get started again. Can you see? Yeah. Do you have some of those slides? Yeah. Uh, Kelly's going to send them. No, she's going to send them out to everybody.